All right. So yesterday you got to read a song of myself 15, which is basically just an ode to people watching, right? Um, and I had everybody kind of look at this and pick a character, think, think through it that way. So I'm gonna go ahead. I know you read it yesterday, but I missed out on it. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and read it today. And then uh, we'll start talking about those characters a little bit um, and how, how Whitman sort of looks at and treats people. Okay. The pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of his foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp. The married and unmarried children write home to their Thanksgiving dinner. The pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with a strong arm. The mate stands braced in the whaleboat, lance and harpoon are ready. The duck shooter walks by silent and cautious stretches. The deacons are ordained with crossed hands at the altar. The spinning girl retreats and advances to the hum of the big wheel. The farmer stops by the bars as he walks on a first day loaf and looks at the oats and rye. The lunatic is carried at last to the asylum, a confirmed case. He will never sleep anymore as he did in the cot in his mother's bedroom. The jeweler printer with gray head and gaunt jaws works at his case. He turns his quid of tobacco while his eyes blur with the manuscript. The malformed limbs are tied to the surgeon's table. What is removed drops horribly in a pail. The quadroon girl is sold at the auction stand. The drunkard nods by the barroom stove. The machinist rolls up his sleeves. The policeman travels his beat. The gatekeeper marks who pass. The young fellow drives the express wagon. I love him, though I do not know him. The half-breed straps on his light booth to compete in the race. The Western turkey shooting draws old and young. Some lean on their rifles, some sit on logs. Out from the crowd steps the marksman, takes his position, levels his piece. The groups of newly come immigrants over the wharf for levy or cover the wharf for levy. As the woolly pates hoe in the sugar field, the overseer views them from his saddle. The bugle calls in the ballroom. The gentlemen run for their partners. The dancers bow to each other. The youth lies awake in the cedar roof garret and harks to the musical rain. The wolverine sets traps on the creek that helps fill the Huron. The squaw wrapped her yellow hemmed cloth wrapped in her yellow hem cloth is offering moccasins and bead bags for sale. The connoisseur peers along the exhibition gallery with half shut eyes bent sideways. As the deckhands make fast the steamboat, the plank is thrown for the shore going passengers. The young sister holds out the skein, that's yarn, while the elder sister winds it off in a ball and stops now and then for the knots. The one year wife is recovering and happy having a week ago born her first child. The clean haired Yankee girl works with her sewing machine or in the factory or mill. The paving man leans on his two handed rammer. The reporter's lead flies swiftly over the notebook. The sign painter is lettering with blue and gold. The canal boy trots on the towpath. The bookkeeper counts at his desk. The shoemaker waxes his thread. The conductor beats time for the band and all the performers follow him child is baptized, the convert is making his first professions, the regatta is spread on the bay, the race is begun, how the white sails sparkle. The drover watching his drove sings out to them that would stay. The peddler sweats with his pack on his back, the purchaser higgling about the odd set. The bride unrumples her white dress, the minute hand of the clock moves slowly. The opium eater reclines with, with rigid head and just open lips. The prostitute draggles her shawl. Her bonnet bobs on her tipsy and pimpled neck. The crowd laugh at her blaggard oaths. The men jeer and wink to each other. Miserable. I do not laugh at your oaths, nor jeer you. The president holding a cabinet council is surrounded by the great secretaries. On the piazza walks three matrons, stately and friendly with twined arms. The crew of the fish, fish smack pack repeated layers of halibut in the hold. The Missourian crosses the plains, toting his wares and his cattle. As the fare collector goes through the train, he gives notice by the jingling of loose change. The floormen are laying the floor, the tinners are tending the roof, the masons are calling for mortar. 
in single file, each shouldering his hod, pass onward the laborers. Caesar and pursuing each other, the indescribable crowd is gathered. It is the fourth of seventh month, what salutes of cannon and small arms. Seasons pursuing, oh, so that was July 4th right there, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Seasons pursuing each other, the plower plows, the mower mows, and the winter grain falls in the ground. Off on the lakes, the pike fisher watches and wakes by the hole in the frozen surface. The stumps stand thick round the clearing. The squatter strikes deep with his ax. Flat boatmen make fast towards dusk near the cottonwood or pecan trees. Coon seekers go through the regions of the Red River or those through those drained by the Tennessee or the, through those of the Arkansas. Torches shine in the dark that hangs on the Chattahoochee or Al Altamaha. Patriarchs sit at dinner with sons and grandsons and great grandsons around them and walls of adobe in canvas tents, rest hunters and trappers after their day's sport. The city sleeps and the country sleeps. The living sleep for their time. The dead sleep for their time. The old husband sleeps by his wife and the young husband sleeps by his wife. And these tend inward to me and I tend outward to them. And such as it is to be of these more or less I am and of these one and all, I weave the song of myself. So um, I wasn't here to talk through the first song of myself with you but there's a few things that you should definitely know about women that are worth um, knowing and understanding. So I had all of you um, look at um, Song Myself One Without Me, where he says, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I shall assume, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood formed from this soil, this air, born here, of parents born here, from parents the same and their parents the same. I now 37 years old in perfect health begin, hoping to cease not until death. Creeds and schools in abeyance. That was probably the part that threw you. That's a weird part. Retiring back a while sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check with original energy. So the first thing you should know about Whitman, um, worth thinking about and writing down, is that when Whitman says, I celebrate myself and sing myself, he's not necessarily being like arrogant and cocky. Like I'm the man, I'm awesome. I celebrate me because I'm the goat. Um, it's not actually that at all. It's an invitation. And what I assume, you shall assume, for everything that belongs to me also belongs to you. So it's not necessarily so much of a, I'm awesome, I'm the goat, as it is, I want to invite you on this journey. Song of Myself has 52 poems. There's 52 weeks in the year, right? Um, it's no coincidence because um, he, he wants to kind of take us on a bit of a journey. So when he says song of myself or when Whitman says self in general, Whitman doesn't just mean me, right? He says everybody has different versions of themselves. Everybody can see themselves in other people because they're shared humanity. That's something about Whitman that's kind of transcendental, right? So when he sees these people, he sees echoes of himself. He tries to understand them. He tries to like figure out who they are and try to relate to them and try to actually have sympathy and, and care about them. Whitman himself um, was a very open-minded kind of democratic guy. He cared for everybody, right? So when he says, I loaf and invite my soul, I lean and loaf at my knees, he wants you to relax when you read his poetry. Chill out. Don't work so hard to understand it that you don't just like sit and enjoy a little bit. And in the end of Song of Myself One, he says, creeds and schools in abeyance. He says, when you come to my poetry, you don't need to bring your own set of beliefs. You don't need to bring your own prejudices. 
You don't need to bring your own thoughts about whatever you think poetry is. Like, set them aside. Wait a minute. Retiring them back. Re remember where you came from. Remember your religion. Remember your philosophies. Remember what you've been taught. Don't forget those. But set them aside and think about what I'm going to say here. And so that's what Whitman does. What Whitman asks of us is really what we ask of anybody when we talk to them, right? So um, I, I wanted to bring that to your attention in Song of Myself One, because when Whitman says he's celebrating himself, he's also celebrating you. He's thinking hundreds of years later, he knew people would be reading this. So he wants you to like sit back with him and chill and enjoy. I know he sounds like he's um, perhaps uh, a little bit high or something, but he's not. He's just an interesting dude. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Song of Myself 15. Um, if you're like, hey, Mrs. Dawson, you're not going in order. So I'm not going to read all 52 Song of Myself. That's maybe a little bit too many selves for me. We're going to look at 15 and then hopefully if we have some time, um, we'll look at one of uh, uh, my favorite versions. So talk to me a little bit. When you read Song of Myself 15, who are your people? And how do you think Whitman saw them? I want everybody who's around to tell me who you looked at, why you were interested in them. You don't have to like give me your whole song and dance, but why were you interested in them? Um, why are they interesting? Tell me. I was the bride. Yours was the bride? Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh... yep, I gotcha. Because. Which bride? There's like three brides in this poem. The bride that is waiting for the clock or watching the clock slowly. Ooh, yes, her. Is she on the first page, second, or third page? Second, I think. The second page? Yep. I don't know. There she go. Ah, she must be somewhere in here. Uh, she's right in the middle of the second page. It's easy to skip over somebody. Oh my goodness. Ah, here we go. The one year wife or the, no, you said the bride. Right. Yeah. There she is. The bride unrumples her white dress. The minute hand of the clock moves slowly. So that's, I mean, it's just a one sentence image, but it is a haymaker of an image. Why were you interested in it? I just said that, um, you know, when it's like your wedding day, I feel like everything goes so slowly for everyone and she's impatient, I guess. So, yeah. I'm interested in why her dress is rumpled. <laughs> I'm like, what happened? Was she like running from somewhere? Is she like, oh no. But yeah, um, it must be her wedding day, right? So that's such an interesting image. And what is so weird to me, right below her is a drug addict. The opium eater reclines with rigid head and just open lips. So weird to place the bride directly next to the opium eater. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I guess it just tells you that these images are not in any specific order at all. <laughs> So, like, and one more question. Did you feel like the bride was also the wife referred to later? Or no. possibly? No. Because uh, these people aren't necessarily related, right? These are just all people that Whitman either is observing or has observed. He's probably not seeing every single one of these people on the street. He's taking us on a journey like all across the entire United States. But yeah, you would think that he'd probably seen many brides in his lifetime. I like her. All right, someone give us uh, another person who you were interested in. I chose the marksman. 
He says the marksman. Where is he? He's on the first page towards the end of the first page. It says out from the crowd steps the markman. Yeah, there we go. And we actually know where he is, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Because um, there's a turkey shoot. Talk to us about this. Like, why were you interested in it? Uh, well, he talks about the turkey shoot, but he doesn't really say much about the marksman. But I felt like you could tell that he thinks highly of the marksman, but doesn't have to say much about him. So I wanted to, I don't know, I just chose him and I don't know. Well, it's cool too. It's like some of them are leaning on their rifles. Some are sitting on logs. And the interesting thing is this guy hasn't even shot at all. And everybody yeah. knows that he is the marksman. It must be something in the way he stands. It says he takes his position and levels his piece. Like literally when he walks out there, everyone knows he's going to win just by his body language. <laughs> I took it as he's patient. He doesn't just rush it and he just takes his time. Takes his position, levels his piece. Yeah. That's kind of a fun one too, because the, the line before it actually gives you the context of where he's at. Cool. All right. Who's got another one? I know Josie picked a really good one. So I'm excited to talk about hers as well. Um, and, and Ashton's. Ashton's is actually uh, my favorite character in this poem. I did the prostitute. Let uh, me find her. It, she is on. She's like right below the opium meter. <clears throat> yes. Here she is. Yeah. Tell us about her. Uh, well, she has a tipsy and pimpled neck, which I thought was pretty funny. But the crowd also laughs at her blackguard hose. And the men jeer and wink to each other. So, like, obviously she's attractive. <laughs> Despite her pimpled neck. Yeah, I don't know about that, but I guess the men that hear more about that. They're definitely talking about her. She's definitely recognized as a prostitute. Oh, yeah. um, and she's swearing, right? Because people are... She's swearing because people are laughing at her because people are treating her badly. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, slut shaming in a way. Huh. Yeah, you're not wrong. Um, like 1892 slut shaming. <laughs> but the most interesting thing about it is actually nothing to me that the prostitute says or in any way that she's described. Speaking of which, do you think she is necessarily described in a bad way or in a matter of fact way? Uh, more like a matter of fact. How can you tell that Whitman isn't judging her? Because he's not, he's just observing. Well, yeah, he's just telling what he's observing, like what she's wearing and like what the other people around her are doing. She, he's not attacking her. He's also not very impressed by the people who are attacking her. So check out these sections that are in parentheses. So Whitman was a journalist, okay? You know that from the videos and stuff yesterday. Whitman was a journalist, he was a reporter. So he would like, you know, take things down and try to get as much, uh, you know, observation as possible. But when he sees the prostitute and he sees the people laughing at her and jeering and winking, he says, miserable. I do not laugh at your oaths nor jeer you. So when he says miserable, he is, for one of the first times in this poem, judging the men who are treating her badly, and who like are said, being jerks to her. You know, like you said, he's a very democratic guy and he loves almost everybody. So I'd see why he doesn't like this type of behavior. Right. Um, it's not necessarily that he has any particular investment in the prostitute herself. It's not necessarily that he he knows her or is some kind of a, a patron. He just thinks that nobody should be treated that way. And, and I love that of all of the people in this poem, the prostitute is the one he chooses to defend. Well, 
All right. Um, that's enough on on the prostitute. I think she's fascinating. Um, but I think the most most interesting line is that last one. Who else do we have um, in this song of myself? Who else did you pick? I picked the farmer. And I is DC. Yep. Let me find where is our farmer? What page? Line six. Not a cap, it's line nine. Here we go. So, why did you pick this farmer? And what's kind of interesting about him? Um, I picked him because it looks like an easy character to talk about. <laughs> um, he's taking a break. <laughs> I love that you picked the, the farmer who was taking a break. How do you know he's taking a break? Because it says that his first day low. So I'm guessing he's a hard worker, but he's just taking a small break. Yeah. So like um he's you know, he's constantly planting, constantly doing things, but but uh Whitman doesn't choose a, like the transcendentalists who are like, hey, farmers are the best. Uh they're always working with the land. Whitman's like, I want to see a farmer on his day off like that's interesting to me this this dude deserves a break he's at the bars and he's on the loaf you'll notice that that's one of whitman's words that he uses in song of myself one and loaf just means to chill like he's just chilling so it's hilarious to me that you pick the guy who's like i'm a hard worker but today i'm a chill Where do you think he's looking at the oats and rye? So is that actual oats and rye or is that like grain alcohol? Probably alcohol. Yeah, I've always wondered that um, if he's like, it, it's almost like a joke here. It's like, oh, the farmer, he looks at oats and rye, but on his day off, he looks at oats and rye. I think Whitman was kind of a character. I'm not sure if this is a joke, but if it is, I see him. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Did nobody pick the singer? One line, the pure contralto. Any of you sing alto? I love how he's not like the amazing soprano with her aria. He's like, nah, man, pick the alto. I like that. Did you see this one? Did anyone pick this one? Which is this one? The surgeon. The surgeon. <laughs> no, no one's sure. No, no one. Not last year. Whitman isn't worried about being gross, is he? Like, not at all. And if you're like, oh yeah, he describes the best of people, the most beautiful things of people. Well, he also picks the grossest things, the nasty things, the people, the things that people don't want to talk about. Like we said, right? He's got a drug addict in his, his poem that he talks about. Doesn't judge him, but he does talk about him. And here we have the surgeon who's doing amputations. <laughs> Josie, I got to hear about um, the lunatic, because even though that is not modern PC language, it's it's really interesting in, in what it talks about. I don't know, because you see that they're finally have something to accuse him of, but he obviously has trouble sleeping, so he does things for a reason. And he obviously has trouble sleeping anywhere he goes. And I don't really know if they like should accuse him just yet. I don't really, he doesn't state what he did exactly, but we yeah. can obviously hear yeah. him. All it says is that he's a confirmed case. It doesn't say who confirmed him or who is taking him off. Um, 
but we see in the parentheses that Whitman has a soft word for him that he, I mean, did you take that he feels sorry for him? What's interesting about the lunatic is that it seems that Whitman knows him personally yeah. or is familiar, right? Not to be creepy, but I mean, he knows where he sleeps. And so we have this line, which is a line of, of empathy and, and sympathy, right? I mean, it seems like Whitman is accepting that he has to be quote, carried at last, but he also knows that he's not gonna be able to sleep well, as you said, and that's a sad thing, but that's, a, but that's something to have empathy for. And I, I appreciate Whitman's empathy here. Got a lot of cool stuff in this section. Did I get everybody? Okay, so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions and then I'm gonna to try to take us to another section. What is the point of this poem? Like, why do you think Whitman wrote this one? What's it, what's it for? What makes it worth reading or interesting, you know? Uh, to like show all the people who he's observed. Yeah, he doesn't leave anybody out, right? Like, he's not like, oh, let me talk about the people that we think are, you know, awesome or amazing or praiseworthy. He's like, no, let's, let's throw everybody in there, right? So, like you said, very democratic, very like, he's a very American poet in that way, isn't he? He's like, this is America in its entirety. <laughs> Anybody else, do you feel like you understand this poem a little better? Yes, I do. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. Here's the other thing too. I don't think that Whitman would see it as a problem if you don't understand something. He's like, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? He's, he's good with it. So I'm actually, um, I'm gonna stop share just for a second to see if you have any questions you wanna ask. And then I've got today's poem for you to look at um, and kind of like go through and, and tease out the meaning of it. Do you have any questions? Bryson Jagger. They're like, she sees me. <laughs> if, you, if you don't have any questions, that's all fine. Um, do make sure you go ahead and do your discussion um, portion if you have not yet. Um, here is kind of, I wanted to catch up with you, but here is what I want you to look at for today. Okay, this is Song of Myself 10. And I want you to, to think on it. I'll write you a little page after we're done talking, and then I'll let you talk about it together as a class. And and think about what's going on here. Alone far in the wilds and mountains I hunt, wandering amazed at my own lightness and glee. In the late afternoon, choosing a safe spot to pass the night, kindling a fire and broiling the fresh killed game, falling asleep on the gathered leaves with my dog and gun by my side. The Yankee clipper is under her sky sails. She cuts the sparkle and scud. My eyes settle the land. I bend at her prow or shout joyously from the deck. The boatmen and clam diggers arose early and stopped for me. I tucked my trouser ends in my boots and went and had a good time. You should have been with us that day around the chowder kettle. I saw the marriage of the trapper in the open air in the far west. The bride was a red girl. Her father and his friends sat near cross-legged and dumbly smoking. In this case, for the record, dumbly means um, silently. 
They had moccasins to their feet and large thick blankets hanging from their shoulders. On a bank lounged the trapper. He was dressed mostly in skins. His luxuriant beard and curls protected his neck. He held his bride by the hand. She had long eyelashes. Her head was bare. Her coarse straight locks descended upon her voluptuous limbs and reached to her feet. The runaway slave came to my house and stopped outside. I heard his motions crackling the twigs of the woodpile. Through the swung half door of the kitchen, I saw him limpsy and weak and went where he sat on the log and led him in and assured him and brought water and filled a tub for his sweated body and bruised feet and gave him a room that entered from my own and gave him some coarse clean clothes and remember perfectly well his revolving eyes and his awkwardness and remember putting plasters on the galls of his neck and ankles. Um, that's uh, like bandages for, for wounds. He stayed with me a week before he was recuperated and passed north. I had him sit next to me at table. My firelock leaned in the corner. So um, part of the reason I love this poem so much is because it's portrayal of guns in their purpose in early America, like um, what they're for, why people would have them, that kind of thing. Um, so in this poem, I want you to look at Whitman's eyes. He says, I hunt, I do this, I saw the marriage. I want you to decide as you're reading if it means I as in Whitman, like is this him experiencing this? Or is this him telling a story that's somebody else's and, and taking on another self, right? Like how many of these stories seem real to you and what about them makes them seem personal as opposed to public, right? We've got like four or five stories in this one poem. The second thing I want you to do, um, so, so the first thing is to figure out which of these you think Whitman experienced personally and why. And the second one is to figure out why are we placing these people together in this poem? What is the common tie, right? What is their common tie? Are there any questions about what I'm wanting you to do? All right, I am going to put this recording and song on myself 10 up on Schoology so you can work on it, but um, uh, you are welcome to work on it um, as a large group together. And tomorrow I'll have you kind of present your findings and what you think. Um, this is one of my favorite sections of Song of Myself and I think it's really understandable and makes quite a bit of sense. So um, tell me how you enjoy it. All right, have a good day, English 3. Thank you.